Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. All right, welcome back everyone to the Location Sound Podcast. Today we're talking with a production sound mixer from Phoenix, Arizona. Please welcome Adam Hecht. Hello everyone. Hello, Michael. Hey, Adam. Before we get too deep in some stuff, let's just do the usual business and tell us what's in your audio bag. Well, I just had a little bit of an upgrade in my audio equipment as of this week as we're recording this. Um, I traded my Nova 1, a Zaxcom Nova 1, to a Zaxcom Nova 2. Also added with that, I have two fully loaded 414 receivers in it, which makes it have eight channels directly inside of it. I also have a another 414 slot in receiver in a RX4, which basically allows one of their slot in proprietary receivers to have its own head so that you can use it as a, like an external receiver. And that allows me to use all 12 Zaxcom transmitters that I have, which is a mixture of ZMT4s, which are their small miniature Zippo lighter size transmitters, which also can provide 40 volt boom and uh, ZMT four X's. It's a new addition and ZMT three X's, which are the little bit thicker, still small, but last the three X's last on a BT 100 Motorola battery, 12 hours, the four X's last 16. Oh, wow. And for my mics, uh, for boom, I tend to use now Sheps. I have a mini Seamit and a CMC 141. And I uh, use DPA, mixture of 6061s is what I've been using, and 4071s. And I have uh, on order coming some 4063s to go with the three Xs for that low voltage situation. And for IFB, I use Zaxcom, full Zaxcom kit, where I have a mixture of URX 50s for like the crew, URX 100s that I use for the, specifically the sound team, and a couple of URXs that I have on hand for camera hops or extra people on top of my 10 uh, URX 50s if I needed a little extra. Man, I do hear a lot of good compliments of how how light the Zaxcom setup is. Literally for most gigs that I do, I don't even, for on the gig, while I have it on me, I don't even have a bag anymore. I have what's called a feather rig, which is kind of a, a frame that you can screw onto the Nova itself. That's 3D printed, made by a company called Audio Workbench up in Montreal, I believe. And it's basically the frame it has a spot for one of those proto gear slot situations. So you can put like a receiver or I put my camera link transmitter in there, which for my IFB and uh, a battery, a sled. So it's literally just the battery, the mixer and the IFB, which is so light compared to like, like the bigger bags. And that's eight channels of audio. And technically you could do three uh, I, three different IFBs out of that because you have the two in the camera link if you do a stereo signal and you have the 2.4 gigahertz uh, Zaxnet IFB side of things. So you could do three different out of that small little package. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I did a, a short film at a, I think it was at a, a actually it was at Full Sail University in Winter Park, Florida. And we did... Somebody, they wanted extra IFBs or something. And so somebody brought in a Zaxcom unit 
and I had, had one of the students like, hey, can you walk me through this real quick? But we used it just for IFB type stuff. But they had a, there was an SD card, but it was put in upside down. Oh. So we couldn't even use it, couldn't get it out. And I was like, you know, we could take this apart and get this out. And they sound great, too, because it's an all-digital type system. Nice. I'm going to have to explore that more because, uh, like I said, as we get older, our backs are killing us. And if you're like a one-man band kind of situation and you've got extra batteries and extra this and that, it, it can really load up. So, All right, well, let's let's talk about some of the projects you worked on. Uh, you did something for the 2019 Cardinals football season. Tell us about that one. I was part of the enhanced audio side of things. And enhanced audio, so in NFL... There are, I will tell you, tons and tons of different departments. I had no contact with anyone else that was sound. And there was probably people on the field and et cetera. But we were kind of, that was the A2. And actually, previous person on your podcast, Christopher Moss, was my A1. And we were up in the press booth for most of the game. But what we did was we mic'd uh, two players on each side, which are the centers or the guards. And they had uh, stereo mics, which basically it was one, it was on a Zaxcom transmitter. It was my first experience with Zaxcom. And it was basically in the Limo 3 connector. It came out and then split in the two mics, two Sony mics that we put in the front of the shoulder pads to kind of get the like Blue 42, like and all that stuff in the beginning, all the people setting up in the back. We had there because you wanted to get the quarterback. So basically, we were miking them as human plant mics and receiving those up in the press booth. Sounded great. And first of all, we were hired by NFL, not by whoever was there. So like CBS, Fox Sports, whoever was there, uh, we were sending feed to them and we controlled when that sent. And that would only be sent after the huddle and just after the hike. And that's all we ever sent to the trucks because you don't want the huddle because that's secrets. And someone third party could sell those secrets. And then afterwards, you just do a slight fade down and then all the other microphones around the thing, the parabolic mics everyone's used to is getting everything else at that point. Now, did they ever uh, smash up your gear? Oh, tons tons but we a lot of times we pad them on the pads and then we taped the living it was it was like it, when you look at those pads you're like it's not pretty it is not pretty at all um and we sometimes we were i was we were taught by the uh i would call legendary john blankenship out of indianapolis who was in the charge of that division and did our job for like many of the super bowls um he said put another pad type of thing on the other side of the of the uh, chest strap so that you can make sure that when they sit in the benches, the player is not in a position where they're hurting because they have one side, it's a brick and the other one's not. So you had to balance that out. You did have stuff get destroyed or? Oh yeah. We've had a few uh, mics break was there. Not, no transmitters luckily, but a lot of those like the, the pop filter part of the Sony mic completely rip off and they, they get flattened on happens all the time. Luckily, all the equipment is supplied by NFL, and they just quickly send a replacement back. All right. Now, did uh, did you do the whole season with him? So I did a majority of the season. There was a couple of conflicts at the end of it that I wasn't able to make for the last few games of that season. Besides one or two games, I was able to do the whole season at that point, which Cardinals didn't make it any more after that part. So I didn't get any of the like the playoffs or anything like that. But we did the main season for the most part. Okay. You have a, a good friend. He he was uh, this past year for the NFL. He traveled up to every game, but he was a first AC for the Steadicam operator. And he said it was a blast. I mean, they would, I think they would fly out like Monday or Tuesday. Wednesday was rehearsal. Thursday night was the game. He was flying home Friday morning. But he said they were out there with the coin toss. He's right there. And so he said it, it was a lot of fun. So it, It's a lot of fun. And I do, I do like that I wasn't the guy holding the boom, going back and forth on the field, though. I do like chilling in the press box, in the nice padded rooms, and then being able to have 
like right behind us is where catering was for our lunch and then mid game snacks. It was right there. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I enjoy that as well. <laughs> Any other interesting things that happened on that project? So what, what I found inter- what would be interesting specifically for you and the listeners is that I received that job because of after your podcast aired, I contacted Chris Moss and followed your advice. And we talked a little bit. And then a month later or so, he messages me and goes, do you want to work for NFL? Nice. Just out of the blue. And that's how we started our long friendship and also started our NFL season. Well, that's cool. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, you know, people are connecting, you know, because of the podcast. I mean, and, and I also, just having met, you know, so many different mixers from around the country, I've been able to, you know, somebody calls me and says, hey, do you know anybody in the Baltimore area? Do you know anybody in the, you know, Louisiana area? And be able to throw out, you know, a couple people that I would recommend and then it turn into something. So that, that's cool. I love that. It's, I think we're in a great, uh, in a very interesting, not part of the norm type community. We're all like passionate, at least I should say most, cause not all, but most of us are pretty passionate about what we do and we want to talk about it. And we tend to help a lot of times help each other out because I've found that a lot of my jobs come from referrals, maybe not just from the people around here, but from other mixers like you. Uh, making suggestions to the Baltimore mixer, I've got an LA uh, sound mixer suggesting me for different things here in Phoenix or otherwise. Mm. That's awesome. So you've connected with uh, a couple of mixers that were on the show, right? In, that are in the Arizona area? Yes, I have connected. Uh, I already knew Justin Moscow because Justin Moscow is my mentor. Okay. I met Chris Moss, of course. And then uh, Josh Morrison, I did reach out to. Josh Morrison's interesting because he and I had a very similar timing difference, but had a very similar start where we both were students at Arizona State University, even though, yes, we went to university. I get it. We both started there at different times, and we eventually became sound mixers after that. He started in college. I started many years after I graduated. <laughs> I, I tell you what, just, you know, doing the podcast, I've had, uh, there's been a few where we were on set and I started talking to, they came over and they maybe were, were a grip or working with the camera department and they started asking questions. I said, well, yeah. And I said, I also have a podcast if you're interested in learning more. And I tell them, they're like, wait, wait, that's you? And it's like, I, I listened to all the episodes and I'm like, dude, that's awesome. I, I mean, I just, like I said, I, I love being able to to help grow the community. It's one of my, I think satisfactions in life by doing this. So it's cool. It definitely helped start my career, not just for meeting the people, but just learning so much from this podcast. And also even for people like literally last week when I was in LA, I was talking to a friend of mine's boom operator who's just starting out. I said, listen to this podcast. You'll get a lot of information. Not in, I mean, you'll get the equipment, which I've noticed that most episodes is very similar of equipment wise, but you'll get a lot of understanding that a lot of us go through the same things, a lot of, uh, you know, different experiences. They may be different, but there's a lot of similarities and help you get more comfortable in this industry. Yeah. Wow. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on and talk about some more projects. Uh, you did something with, was it Starkeisha? Starkeisha. Uh, Starkeisha is a, a short film I did in, uh, Los Angeles. I received a recommendation for that job from a mixer named uh, John Kubelka, who uh, also is a mentor of Justin, ironically enough. One of our detached mentors, but happens to live out there. Justin just received another gig, and he was like, hey, Adam, can you do this gig? And hey, can you do playback? I had never done playback before. I have the equipment equivalent for it because I've done live event stuff sometimes, but I've never done playback in that way before. So I was like, sure, I'll take the challenge, which was interesting because first day we're north of LA in the desert and they were having issues transporting uh, equipment up the hill where they were with the transpo trucks and trying to get my speakers 
and mixer and everything, because there were some, uh, not really lines, but just stuff to record uh, before. And just trying to get all our equipment up there was a disaster. But what was great about that project was, number one, I worked with a couple people that I had no idea who these people were, but apparently are, you know, have been in a few things. What made this project special was the director's energy, which you don't always get in, in a lot of lower budget indie stuff. And this wasn't lower, lower, but it was that medium sort of space. And the director's name was uh, Mo McRae. And he loved every morning to get everyone together, go over the day, but also say, can I get a heck yeah? I'm just going to say heck yeah for your podcast, but can we get a heck yeah? And everyone had to say heck yeah. And it was just one of those, you don't get it often, because sometimes it's just, you're there, it's kind of a, like a, just another gig for as far as everyone's attitudes, but this was just such a positive energy and a lot of music involved. And it's always fun to have a little music in life and in these projects, which just gives you a more uplift. And, and then I just randomly, uh, I saw a, like an ad for it when it first came out and I didn't even realize it was going to go anywhere and just popped up on Hulu. And that was one of the first things that I've, one of the first few things that I've done that has popped up randomly in my feed. And especially, you know, you don't always, like, especially in my level, you don't always see the, the trailers or commercials or ads for it. But it was just interesting for anything you do. But it's, it was interesting to see on my end. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty cool. Well, well, kind of walk us through your setup for playback. So for playback, I, I use Mackie PA speakers, one or two, depending on how far it needed to go. I either use, at the time, the laptop I had or a iPad, depending on what they needed and et cetera. Like I had a metronome on the iPad so they can just get the rhythm because there was some points where they just needed the rhythm. And I would just connect that via XLR into it. And then on one of the speakers, if I used both or on when we were only using one, we also had a Sennheiser G3 receiver for the voice of God mic that the director held and the choreographer held so they can speak to the talent at the time. Did you have a separate channel with just time code so it's the same every time for playback? Uh, I didn't do any time code for the playback side of things for that project. That's something I'm still trying to figure out how to implement in my setup if I ever get more playback situations. I use wireless time code anyway in my setup, which helps a lot if I had to do that kind of thing. Because I use the, and I even forgot to put this in the beginning, I use the Betso time code system, which uh, it's, it's, a wire, it's a wireless time code system that uh, I find that just works pretty solidly. doesn't have an app, sadly, but um, it just seems like it works every time I do it. Never had a failure once with them. And since it can constantly jam for whatever is in it, it seems like one of those good options if you need to output from a, uh, you know, from a computer in that sense and be able to provide that. Okay. And that's cool. Yeah, that's the thing, too. It's like with time code, it's like once you go down a path, you know, you kind of have to like I, I, I was using or I'm still using the tentacle sync. And it's just like you, you get it and then you get all the cables for it. And then now you've invested a considerable amount of money for, you know, what camera you're using, because I try to buy cables for, you know, every camera that I need to work on versus, you know, counting on somebody to people. Some people say, well, the camera department needs to have that. And it's like, well, most of the time they don't. You know, so I'm always like trying to, to make sure I have everything. But yeah, once you do that, now you have, you know, it's hard to go backwards without, you know, spending a lot of money. I'm currently prepping for a uh, feature film coming up and I'm doing it with Eric Ballou of Cannibal Industries in LA. Oh yeah. When I ordered a, few, a little more uh, Betso time code boxes, uh, he was like, uh, maybe not a good idea to go Betso. And I was just like, I already am in that ecosystem. And he's like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> what, what did he recommend? Uh, he's a Denneke guy. Okay. So the Denneke time code boxes and the Denneke slates. That's good. All right. Well, uh, let's talk about, uh, you also worked on Reggie. So tell us about that project. This was another one where I see a commercial for it randomly. And I'm like, oh, that 
released. So Reggie is a project that's cur- it's a documentary currently on Amazon Prime about Reggie Jackson, the baseball player. I did that in Houston, Texas, because he is one of the coaches for the Houston Astros. And what we did was the normal documentary filmmaking type setup where I put a mic on him. I put a ZMT4 with a, a 6061 mic. And it was just one of those, follow him around, do the thing. We didn't do too many interviews because they apparently have already done it or we're going to do it in a studio later. But it was more just following around. We would go on the field. It was only for a few days of what I was on it. But we would go on the field. We interviewed a couple players We see him coaching, and even though he's an older gentleman at this point, I'm sure he can still hit a home run pretty well. And it was just the normal type follow around gig. He was a really nice guy. The second day, we actually went to this random part of town, like behind a convenience store, and there was a mural for uh, George Floyd. And we were just going there to pay respects and do some B-roll, and This was an interesting moment because we just landed. I'm starting to unpack the car and he starts talking to this passerby who didn't even recognize him. Just started talking about George Floyd, talk about a bunch of things. And it's one of those things that makes you remember uh, how sensitive the laws are. Because even though it's on Reggie and... Luckily, with the Zaxxon system, the transmitter is always recording. So I was having that whole conversation recorded. Uh, I could hear the other gentleman uh, he was talking to pretty clearly. And they were having a really interesting conversation. And at the end, he gave the realization that he was Reggie Jackson. The guy was really surprised. Are you hiding the transmitter on him? Because I guess from a documentary standpoint, you're seeing him from front and back. Are you are you putting an ankle strap or anything? I, as a recall for him, I just threw it in his pocket because it the ZMT4 is so small that it do, you barely even see it. And I think I routed it because he, as a recall, he tucks his shirt in. So I kind of routed it through his shirt and then under the belt loop under the belt in the loops and it went right in the pocket and because it was uh you know it wasn't like a narrative sort of setting i would be seeing a tiny little cord is fine but the lav had to be hidden on the actual top so it's not obviously seen okay now what's your your favorite expendable when you're mounting lavs and stuff so i've been actually following a there's another mixer named mcmanus out of uh in the uk who has been doing, uh, he does a lot of the Top Gear type projects. And the kind of expendables that I would do is following his example, which is the Rycote Sticky, or any kind of like sticky circle, and the Fur Circle type situation. But what he does is he adds a little bit of extra sticky to keep the fur on a little bit more. And then I put a little sticky on the other side of the rye coat just to, because sometimes those circles, whether it's Ursa, rye coat, etc., doesn't stick enough. I put some super sticky on that. And then what he does is instead of having the fur pointing outside, because the fur, you know, kind of gets rid of the wind noise, but not so much, he puts it on the inside for just the chest hair, because the rye coat sticky is actually a better uh, wind jammer than the wind jammer. So it helps protect with the chest hairs or anything like that, and the rubbing with the fur, and the other side's blocking it because of the sticky. And it does a pretty good job a lot of the time. Okay. Yeah, I've I've done that as well. I have a couple guys that I've worked with, but they they shave their chest, so they have all this stubble. And so if you turn that fur facing Mm. the chest, you do, yeah, you get a little more less uh, scratchy because I'm like, dude, I mean, you know... (laughs) So, yeah. And you know what I did recently? I was working on a short film and the guy was wearing a t-shirt. It wasn't super tight, but I, and I never usually stick anything on anybody's skin, but, um, I did, I had that little fur, uh, facing out and, and I did do, I think I did, I I think, I don't know if it was an Ursa sticky or if it was a Rycote sticky. And I, you know, did right, right there roughly around the sternum. And then I 
came underneath the pectoral muscle and then down the side. And I got amazing results. You didn't see it. And, and he was, you know, you saw him from front and back and stuff. So it had an ankle strap with a transmitter on. And I was, you know, he was cool with it. And I said, do you have any allergic reaction or anything? Because you got to be careful about that sometimes people. But he said, no, no. And now the only thing, when he got real sweaty, you know, it would fall off. But most of the time it did pretty good. But he, he was saying that he had a guy work with him and that, they, you know, they have that, I forget which what it is. This, it's the spray you spray on, and, and it's supposed to be super dry. And he says, yes. they tried it. They, they were like, yeah, watch this. And he said it fell off every time. So, so you know, it's just, it just depends. You know, we always talk about it. You know, it works until it doesn't work. The Joe Sticky stuff I've been starting to use more, which has helped with that, especially in this Arizona 110, 120 degree heat. Uh, Joe Sticky stuff has been a lifesaver. Mm. You know, I still use it almost every every job. And you know what I started using too? I, I still use Hydamike a lot and they have a bra clip that's perfect for the for the women. And you can and sometimes I'll wrap a little bit of the Joe sticky stuff around that and you can clip it and just kind of pinch it a little bit and it really hangs on. And uh, so I do that a lot too, but but Hydamike is one of my favorites, so. I've been liking for bra clips the Viviana Beetle and the bra clip accessory with it. Daniel's a fun gentleman, by the way. If you ever interview him from Viviana Straps, oh my goodness, he's a, he's, he's a ball of energy. But yeah, the, where I like to use that for my bra clips because I can you know move that mount to like many different things. Like even if I need to do a quick vampire clip, it's really nice to be able to not have to buy something that's a dedicated for a mic like the cost 11 vampire mic, et cetera, even though I don't use cost 11s anymore, but having something that's specifically, that's just the actual mount is what's specific to the mic, not the actual clip itself. I'm, I was finding, you know, we, we kind of deviated from Reggie, but did you work on that whole project from start to finish? No, I actually only worked for a few days in Houston. Okay. Um, but those few days were very enlightening. And the fact that one of my interviews is actually in the trailer with in, yeah in the trailer with one of the players was something surprising to me. But it was it was a really fun few days. Yeah, you know, I, I worked on a well, I just did some interviews here in Florida uh, for there was a Chicago Cubs. It, it was it was for the Hispanic players. Um, they were working on a documentary, and I I have looked everywhere to see if I could find it. I don't know if that ever you know happened or not. It's hard to say, but. I'll keep looking. <laughs> so it's it, it's fun to do those, you know. And also, that was the first time when they showed up, they, they had their own mic that they wanted to use, their own shotgun mic. I'm like, okay, because they'd been using it on every other interview. I was like, all right, we can do that. Makes sense, trying to match the mics to the previous thing. Uh, no one asked me at that point uh, my mics at that. Uh, so I just used, at the time, my MKH-50 most of the time. And, uh, yeah, I was just doing the DPA 6061s. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, you did something for it. Was it Eckridge smoked sausage? Yes. So that's an interesting, fun story. I will start with actually starting a year before I did that, where random job posting on whatever site at the time, somewhere in the middle of Arizona, worked a gig. It was okay. Came back home. Didn't think of it. A few months later, which was January... 2020, I get a message from the director of that project. It was like, you're my favorite sound mixer I ever worked with. Do you mind coming out to LA to help me on a personal project, even though it's going to be very low money? And I'm like, sure. I'm trying to get a little bit more into it. It was still sort of closer to my beginning. So I was like, okay, I'll try it. A few months later in July, had another personal project of his. And it's like, okay, cool. This one had lodging. Cool. Whatever. Starting out. But then I randomly get a call from a project that wants to shoot in Malibu, California. No idea who the person on the phone is. Uh, Just pitch my full rate. They're like, sounds good. So I go down there. The director of that project is that same director from every single project. Even though I did those lower personal projects for him, he suddenly got me on this really high-end commercial situation, which was just a bunch of small YouTube videos that Eckridge Smoked Sausage was making, even though it was just, it was interesting because it was for YouTube. And this happens a lot, I'm finding now, especially in this age uh, since COVID. A lot of companies will put so much money into these commercials 
that are only going to Instagram, to, to YouTube, and et cetera. So this Eckridge Farm was just a set of commercials, and it was my first bigger project since COVID started. And it was intense, especially since a couple of days into the project, uh, IATSE said they were going to shut us down because it wasn't a union project. And but then they never showed up because they probably didn't want to go all the way to Malibu. But it was a fun few days in Malibu doing the simplest of setups, basically booming the whole time, except for one scene where it was like a chef jacket situation and I put it on a chef jacket. But for that whole project, it was just boom because no one, everyone was worried about uh, not interacting with talent in the beginning of COVID and just as least likely as possible. But there was some of the most funniest commercials that were outrageous. Like literally the first one I get it there, it's a shirtless guy at a barbecue. And I'm like, I'm, I'm supposed to mic this guy? And it's like, no, just just boom. And they, they turned out very hilarious. If you search on their YouTube channel, I think it's the You Do You campaign that they did back then. You'll get a lot of those videos. Nice. Okay, so you have some nightmare projects. So uh, are any of those projects your worst onset experience? Yes. So the two projects that I specifically sent, uh, one of them is a worst onset experience because of environment issue. The other one is because of production issue. Which one would you like first? Let's go with the production issue first. So this is uh, back in May 2020 when the lockdowns were just, you know, they were there. They were starting we didn't know much about COVID at the time. The pandemic unemployment had not gone through yet. So it was kind of like, you know, I not worked for a while, need some money. So a friend of mine reached out and we worked on this ultra, ultra low budget, probably shouldn't have been working on type project, but it was like, I needed the money. I was desperate. I'll admit it. Had a boom op on it, luckily, that they paid for, which in Arizona, that rarely ever happens. And basically, we did this project, and I knew the director, producer on it. He's a complete low-budget jerk, expects the world, but yet pays as little as possible. I had a transmitter go down at one point because sweat got in it. Luckily, Electrosonics at the time, when I had Electrosonics replaced that. I had a newer mixer that I had just gotten, the 833, and that was like freezing mid-take. And it's May, so it's hot outside when we were outside. And we dealt with this DP, this camera person, that he had this attitude. And I've worked with him once before on a previous feature with the same kind of group that he just, he has this attitude of, you know, he, like he knows better than anyone, talks down to everyone. But he's only, this is like a second project that wasn't wedding photography. And... So he's, you know, just talking down to everything. I'm kind of in my, at my cart, so I'm not really dealing with him too much. On the last night I was on that project, we were at hour 14, three in the morning. And we're doing an action scene, which he white balances to the lights on, even though the lights are supposed to be off. And he needs them on to see my slate. And my slate has a light in the back of it a backlight so you can see the stuff when it's dark. So it's just, this guy is just, you know, uh, inexperienced all around. Uh, we do this like action scene thing. It's it gets so bad where it's like, he, he would never communicate whether he's ready. The AD would say to the camera person, hey, are you ready? And he's like, what do you think? And he just wouldn't communicate and had this attitude the whole time. Once we wrapped that night and they brought us to our cars because we couldn't park in the neighborhood because, you know, HOAs, we get there and the camera department, besides him and the Griffin Electric department, everyone told me that he was especially abusive. I will call it abusive to my boom operator. My boom operator didn't tell me a thing. It was the rest of the crew that told me. And I already dealt with his attitude, dealt with, and just dealt with all this stuff. And like the kind of things he would do is like, he wouldn't let the boom operator look at the monitor 
to see where he can be, nor would the director. He would just demand, you can't be there, blah, 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 and barking orders and just talking down to him. And at the end of that night, I sent an email to my friends who were the production coordinator and the assistant director. I said, hey, if he's like this for another day, and it's because of how low we're being paid, it's not worth being on this project. So if he continues this attitude, I walk. The next email I get, one of the actors had COVID. We need everyone to get tested. And I was one of five cases that had COVID. I was out for a month, missing a higher budgeted project that I was supposed to do later that month. I get a project that's just hell to be on and at the end getting COVID at the end of it missing another project and what makes it worse is earlier that morning on that last day of shoot that actor had called the production and said hey I'm not feeling well this morning and they said come on in you gotta love those kind of projects and I got COVID a second time also actually a few months ago and that one lasted, it was very quick. I thought it was just a bad allergy season because I've had bad allergy seasons where I felt horrible. Um, and I thought it was just that. And I randomly felt like maybe I should just test just in case. Positive all around. I'm like, oh. Luckily, I wasn't as miserable as the first time. But it was just annoying. But luckily, I had a project that I was like, please, there's a project that I really wanted to do. And I was like, please, I got to make it to this project. I don't want to miss as much as I did because I feel fine. I feel fine for a month. And I made sure to make the project. There was just one day a pickup from a feature I did in Oklahoma City that they were doing here. And it, the whole day was basically one actor the whole time. And it's like, I wanted to meet that actor and work with him. And I hired a boom operator because originally it was one man band. I hired a boom operator for that day to be my hands on set. Just in case, I was way beyond, I was negative at that point, but still just to that off chance just to be safe. So I hired a boom operator to be my hands. It was just a fellow sound mixer here, Daniel Reddick. He's a great guy. And the actor that we were filming all day was Eric Roberts. $5,000 in cue cards gets you him. I didn't want to miss that. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Now, uh, did you always want to be in the sound department? So... When I first went to college in film, I went in for directing, as a lot of film students do. Eventually, I was very antisocial, moved on to editing near the tail end of my college career. And then in that final semester, which was a summer semester, I did this joint professional and student film, which was not really student. It was more like the students were kind of the grunt work and the department heads were professionals in the industry. In the production side of things, I did on-set post, which was, you know, okay. I was very antisocial at that point. I didn't really like hanging out with people. So I thought editing, being in the computer, was my thing. When we moved to post for that project, which was a similar sort of thing, department heads, but the department heads were professors at that school. And editing had an editing professor, VFX had a VFX professor, and then sound had a producer. Didn't have a sound professor at all. Originally was in VFX. They showed me the program Nuke, and my eyes crossed because I had no idea what the heck they were talking about. So they moved me to sound. And for post-sound, it was kind of like a trial by fire because the guy didn't know what the heck he was doing. So we had to learn pro tools of all projects, like on our own. And they would bring in this local uh, re-recording mixer to kind of teach us the kind of little things that we needed to do. But we were mostly on our own teaching ourselves on this application that we've never touched. And I realized then for my whole life, I've had music, I've had audio as my thing. I'm a listener. I absorb more listening, especially like I listen to audiobooks, podcasts, etc. I tend to absorb better. So audio started to make sense being in that project. And when that ended, I transitioned, because I graduated, I transitioned to kind of like the person that takes what we did and put it to what the re-recording mixer that came in to something that he can edit. And then I followed him to his studio and I became his Foley artist. 
and I still am his Foley artist today. So that, I just kind of fell into it. And then in 2018, because of another job, I was uh, recommended to be production sound for some small film, someone's personal small film project. I'd never done it. I had a couple of things for home recording, uh, like a Tascam DR60, one Sennheiser mic, and an NTG2 at the time, and... I ordered myself like a Audio Technica, like less than a hundred dollar lav, just to have a second mic, and did this project. It was the first time I ever been paid or did that kind of thing. Besides in film school, where he had like an hour of something, and production sound became the love because it actually paid, which Foley doesn't pay much here, and it allowed me to make a living and. It was a lot more fun. It seemed like finally in my life, I was able to do something that I was actually, you know, whether it's good at or not, but at least enjoy doing. All right. Well, I mean, is there another project that we haven't touched on that you'd like to talk about? Well, I was going to say the other bad onset experience was Hands of Hell, which was a horror film I did in the f- August 2022. It's one of those... Low budget horror, you know, the normal thing. It was fun to work on, fun people and et cetera. But it was a comedy of errors in the middle of a town in Texas that was like straight out of deliverance. Like weird things would happen. Number one, just a smaller thing is an AC dropped like one of those uh, hoods for the camera into a lake which was fun. But for me specifically, there was a couple of things. One, I was recording a scene we were right by a dock and you know, the scene was okay. I press stop and suddenly I hear a, a, a distorted scream in my equipment. No idea where it came from. And I wish I was recording it because it was the weirdest thing. I turned to the producer next to me and go, hey, is this place haunted in any way, just to be funny? And he goes, oh, yeah, there's a ton of things here. And I was like, okay. And then the worst part was, for a whole, like, a week or so, we were shooting on this boathouse in, on this dock. And, you know, normally it's like, oh, it, we shot almost the whole thing inside the boathouse. So it's like, why do we need to be on the dock on an actual boathouse? We can recreate this. But anyway, we were in the next boat over. One thing about this dock we were filming in, it was crawling and like covered in spiders of all shapes and sizes. And multiple times, a couple of them would be above me coming down. Let's just say I didn't have arachnophobia until after that project. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's pretty creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, man, well, as we uh, get ready to wrap, do you have any advice for those starting out that you could uh, recommend? Number one, listen to this podcast is a very important thing to get different perspectives and kind of, uh, you know, understanding different people and what they do in different places. Also, number two, reach out to people, especially in your area, but reach out to people, not necessarily say, hey, get me a job. But reach out to people to kind of start building relationships because you never know what could come from that. Excellent. Yeah. And well, thank you for recommending the podcast. Well, uh, how can people best connect with you, you know, online? You could go to my Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I am under Ash Sound LLC. That is A S H Sound LLC. Or you can email me directly at Ash Sound LLC at gmail.com. Awesome. All right, man. I want to say a a big thanks to Adam Hecht for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, Michael. And I'd like to say thanks to everyone for listening. If you have questions or would like us to discuss a particular topic, email us at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.